Scripture reading this morning is from Luke 25 through 37. Just when a lawyer, just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to, to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law, what do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved to pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him in his own, on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you, you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. A few weeks ago, we had the uh, blessed privilege of hearing our own E.J. Lee preach. And uh, I don't know if you discovered this, but I discovered she can preach. Um, she has been given a gift. And so um, I wanted to invite her back to share with us um, and to have her proclaim the word of God to us this morning. So E.J., we're all yours. Good morning. He is risen. We can't forget that it's still Easter. I am really excited to be up here today. I, I'm so excited for what's happening through Hilltop. It's been so much fun uh, to be a part of staff meetings and ad council meetings and just a body of people who, who truly want to become better disciples of Jesus Christ and who are intently listening for how the Holy Spirit is moving us in and uh, who genuinely want to reach people outside these walls. So I am extra excited to be sharing a message that I feel like will, will allow all of us, every person in this room, to do that better um, and to do it better right where we are, where we're living. With our, with our neighborhoods. As I was writing this sermon over the past couple of weeks, I really gave a lot of time to figuring out how to, to not only inspire and teach, but to give practical advice and ways for us to, to put it into action. Um, it really was a wake-up call even for myself as I took time reading and praying and preparing this message today. So I hope that it will inspire you, and I hope you do learn something. And I also hope that it's a wake-up call to you as well, and we can all be called into action through uh, the Word of God. So I've lived in Mankato since I was a second grader. We've lived in two different neighborhoods, and they're completely different stories from from my perspective at least. The first neighborhood that we lived in, we lived from second grade to sixth grade for me. And we had next door neighbors on both sides, we had people across the street, and I couldn't even tell you one person's name. I don't think I ever met either neighbor uh, who were next to us, and I think I maybe met one family that was across the street from us. But again, couldn't tell you a single name, and I wouldn't recognize them if I saw them in a grocery store. 
And then in sixth grade, we moved to a new neighborhood, and it was completely different. Um, I went from not knowing any of my neighbors' names to having a bigger family. And that's really what it was at 108 Park Place for my family. We moved just two years ago, but we were there from sixth grade uh, to the middle of my college career, so we were there for a long time. And the quality of the relationships there were lifelong. And even though we've moved out now, I continue to spend time there. And I even lived with uh, one of the families who happens to be here today. And they didn't know I was going to talk about them, but it's more fun to leave that up for a surprise. <laughs> so um, to, to illustrate those relationships and what that was like, the family who moved from out of state into the house that we moved out of, their daughter was a flower girl for our wedding. Uh, even though we had moved out, we still were back and spending time with them because they became uh, such good friends and really family. And I've even slept in the house that we moved out of after another family moved in. If that can show you, like, really what it was like. And it was completely black and white different from, from the neighborhood that I lived in from second through sixth grade, where I couldn't even tell you my neighbors' names. And I, I'm so grateful and I have been grateful, but I feel like I've really come to recognize the great blessings that I've learned from the Bergs and from the Steinbachs and from the other families in my neighborhood about how to truly put others' needs and desires above our own and to allow ourselves to be interrupted. Uh, we live in a culture that's so fast-paced and we have, we have super busy lives that it's it tends to be very self-centered, where it's very difficult for us to allow ourselves to be interrupted. And so I've learned so much from those neighbors, and I'm super grateful for that. Uh, we, we all have neighbors, and many of us have neighbors who we could talk to from our own driveway. We share lawns with them. And, uh, or if ma you live in an, uh, an apartment like Matthew and I just moved into, we share a hallway and an elevator with a dozen different neighbors. And I want to I have a disclaimer here to start, because you might be out there thinking and wondering, okay, so this neighboring thing, that's for the people who are super outgoing, super happy all the time, just love talking to everybody, and not me. But that's not true. Everyone in here has something very valuable to offer to those around them, and God wants to use that. And all of your neighbors, even if maybe you don't think so, have something valuable to offer to you as well. So this is for everyone. You can't sit back and half listen. This is for everyone here. It's, uh, the idea of neighboring is in Matthew 22 and Luke 10. It is written in the Old Testament, but Jesus comes along, and he's the one who kind of gives it the oomph. It's Matthew 22 when there are some scholars discussing uh, what the most important commandment is. And so one of them decides to ask Jesus what the most important commandment is. And he responds with loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, and the second is like it. And it's to love our neighbor as ourselves. And then he had something amazing and astounding. He says that it is upon these two commandments that all the law and prophets depend. Everything else is to be built on these two things that our lives here, lives back then, and our lives right now, everything is to be built upon loving God and loving others. And we have the, the authority of the Son of God. We have Jesus Christ telling us something amazing about God's plan and purposes for this world. So why, if Jesus has made it very clear, and this isn't the only scripture where he talks about this, if he makes it so clear how important it is to love our neighbors, then why is it not a priority for us? Why is it not something that we intentionally plan out in our weeks to make sure that we do? Thinking about it, because we've heard this great commandment so much, I feel like we, we hang it up in our houses or we put it on a bumper sticker and we almost make it a metaphor, something like that we think is great and we believe in and we'll even quote it word for word from the Bible, but it's something that we don't, 
really take into action and take literally to do. When Jesus said this, he wasn't meaning it to be a figurative statement to propel us into making short-term decisions that don't really take much effort from us, like buying a pair of shoes from a company that will then donate a pair of shoes to someone in need or donating clothes when we're done wearing them. Or maybe you find an extra $5 bill in your wallet when you're in the drive through so you decide to pay for the person behind you, and then you're good for the month or the year. That's our act of kindness, and we tell ourselves we're good neighbors. And all those things are good, and I think that we need more of them. And we should do those things very often. But Jesus was meaning that loving our neighbors was to be so much more and bigger. It's supposed to be a way of life for us. What if we took Jesus' words literally? What if a missions trip was something we took every time we walked out our front door? What if loving our neighbor was actually loving and having a relationship with the people who live next to us. Our scripture reading today is very familiar to most of us, a story that's been told so many times that the title is even a commonplace term to use in a conversation, the Good Samaritan. But sometimes when we hear a story so much, it, we become numb to it, and we don't really think about what it's teaching us. We are taught that the story is to illustrate and have God have Jesus explain who our neighbor is, and the answer is everyone, which is true. Our neighbor is the mom on our, soccer, our kid's soccer team. Our neighbor is the barista that hands us our coffee in the morning. And it's even the telemarketer who's called us twice this week and we don't feel like talking to. Those are all our neighbors, and we're called to love them. But I think Jesus is also demonstrating how to love our neighbors. Not just who, but how. When we look at the story of the Good Samaritan, there are a few things that we really need to realize and pay attention to. First, we know that this man is a Samaritan, and the man that he's helping is from a people group that, that hated each other. So if he had just walked on by in his own merry way, nobody would have blamed him. But he saw him hurting, and he went to him. And the second thing that we need to notice is that he allowed his schedule to be interrupted. He probably had somewhere to be in a half an hour that he needed to get to, but he saw someone who needed him. God placed someone in front of him, and he chose to stop his itinerary, step out of what his needs and desires were, and help somebody else. The third thing that we need to pay attention to is that he not only met the man's immediate need by bandaging him and pouring wine and oil, but he took him to an inn, paid for him to be able to stay there, paid for someone to take care of him, and even said that he would return and cover the cost of anything more that came up. He not only met his needs for right then and there, but he met his needs for a journey, for a time moving forward. Loving our neighbors is not just a single act, but it's a relationship, and it's a journey. When we put all of our neighboring efforts into momentary relief for people far away or people that we never see again, we miss out on the restoration that happens through long-term relationships with others. Relief and restoration are different, but they both matter. Relief can happen without relationship, but restoration can't. If people need food or shelter, we are called to do what we can to help them. However, when we choose to get to know people, and to actually have relationships with them, then restoration can happen to us, to our neighbors, to our entire communities, our cities, and bigger. Restoration through relationship might feel intimidating and might feel discouraging to you, but don't be discouraged because God wants to use us. He desperately wants to use us. So if we come before him and ask him for courage, if we ask him for insight, whatever we need, he is ready to answer but we need to get on our knees and ask him to help. And he will provide the Holy Spirit. We just have to ask. I heard a sermon a couple of months ago, and it really struck me. It brought life to something that I, I hadn't seen before. The pastor was answering the question, why doesn't God answer my prayers? And someone in the audience asked it, and he 
we talked about how the, there really are needs around us, and we all have a neighbor who has some need that we're not even aware of, some struggle. There will be neighbors that you have that really are going through something tough that, that need their prayers to be answered, and God wants to answer their prayers. But what this pastor said was that if we as believers, as Christ followers, aren't listening to God's call on our lives, if we're not in tune with his will, then he won't be able to answer their prayer because we are the answer. He needs to use us to answer those prayers. And if we're not paying attention or we're too busy in our own lives for our own needs and desires, then that prayer doesn't get met. This is very convicting to me, and um, I'm sure it is for you as well. Our world tells us to be so busy, but we need to slow down a bit. We need to allow ourselves to be interrupted. We need to put relationships as high on our priority list as Jesus did. There's a neighboring movement in Denver, Colorado. It is over 70 different churches who are really on board with changing how we neighbor as Christians. And they did a study a couple years ago when they first started, and they had everybody draw a tic-tac-toe board, and their house was in the middle. And then they said, the eight, eight boxes around you are the eight closest homes to you. And only 40% were even able to put the names of half of those squares around them. Only 40% could name four neighbors' names. And less than 1% was able to do all eight and to tell what at least one thing about them, like what their job is or something about their family. If we are going to take Jesus' words seriously and not just put them on a bumper sticker, then I think neighboring is, is supposed to look a lot differently. When Jesus tells us to love our neighbors, he's not instructing us to only help the enemy on the side of the road. He's telling us to love our actual neighbors, the people that God puts right in front of us, and the people who live next door. We're called to be Easter people. We live in a resurrection world, and Easter is everywhere. The last time I was here, we t talked about being awake and noticing God moving in our lives and through our lives. And the call today is to allow God to use us in others' lives, to be Easter in others' lives, in our neighbors' lives, the people who live right next door. As I mentioned at the beginning, I took quite a bit of time to try to figure out how to put this into practice, to give good advice of how we, everyone, as an individual, can take that next step with our neighbors. And I decided that there are a few stages of neighboring. The first stage is the wave stage. You pull into your driveway, your neighbor's outside, you give them a kind wave. And that's about it. You don't even know their name, even though you've lived there for a few years. The next stage is the hey man stage, or hey dude. It's what you do when you are hoping they don't realize you don't know their name, but, you know, you, you have to act friendly, right? And then the next stage is the hey bob stage where you actually know their name and you've had some conversations about the weather or about how a local sports team is doing. Maybe you know your, their occupation at this point. I want to challenge everyone in this room this week, I'm being very specific here and intentional, with at least one neighbor, whatever stage you're at with them, from the wave stage to the hey bob stage, take the next step. I know it can be intimidating, especially if there is a neighbor that you've waved at for a few years and you don't know their name. It's not very fun to ask them their name, right? But pray to God and, and ask him for encouragement and for, for the Holy Spirit to give you comfort and courage to do that. Just when you, when you wave as you pull in the driveway, park and get out and then go talk to them. Ask them how they're doing. Say, I know that we've lived by you for quite a while now, but I don't know that we've properly introduced. And say your name. They'll say their name back. So take the next step. And if you're already at the Hey Bob stage, 
ask them for dinner. Ask them to come over and have dinner with you. Or maybe have a barbecue in your backyard and ask them to come over. Or better yet, have a barbecue in your front yard and just put a bunch of chairs out in your front yard and anybody that walks by, invite them over. Anybody who wants to come. And when they do come, start intentional conversations with them. Learn their names. That's the first step. It's, it's just a small step. And then you take another small step. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a journey. And it will. It will change your life. It'll change your neighbor's lives. And it will grow from there. This is what we're made for. Jesus tells us this, that our lives should be built upon loving God and loving our neighbors. So we know that the most fulfilling life is a life where we actively, intentionally have relationships with our neighbors. Last time I was up here, um, when we were talking about being awake for God, or be awake and, and watching for God so we don't miss him. We were, I feel like sometimes, I don't want to call us selfish, but I, I suppose it's self-centered. We think of everything from our own perspective and what God's trying to do for us in our lives and how he's using other people in our lives. But what if we also thought about what God's trying to do in other people's lives? And we can't guess either. Uh, we can't just assume what our, what our neighbors need. Uh, if we, ha we have a neighbor that their lawn's getting long, um, I wouldn't recommend just going over and mowing it. Uh, if, it's different if you already have a relationship with them, but if this is someone you don't actually have a relationship with, there are two things I want to point out. One, a relationship is going to do way more than just a simple act of kindness for them, and then that's it and there's, there's no relationship. And secondly, your, your neighbor might actually be embarrassed, and they might think that you were embarrassed of their lawn, and that's why you came over and mowed it. So what if you started a conversation with them, you saw them outside, and you just said, hey, is there anything on the docket this weekend that I could help you with or do with you? And you find out that they've been meaning to clean out their garage for a couple of months, but it seemed overwhelming by themselves. So then you get to do that with them. And that will do so much more than just doing something for them and not actually starting a relationship. Doing something with them, you get to have intentional conversations. You get to learn more than just their name. They get to learn more about you. We can't look at our neighbors as problems who need solutions. And we certainly never want them to feel like that. Neighboring is give and receive, too. We have to break down our walls a little bit as Minnesotans and allow others to neighbor us. I, uh, I do this too. If someone offers to give me something or help with something, no, no, don't worry. I'll do it myself or I'll take care of it myself. And I think that most of us do that. We, we say no at least two or three times before we allow someone to do something for us. And uh, we think of, I, th I think of the saying, Blessing blesses the blesser, or that form of that. And we think of that for ourselves, like us blessing someone else will bless us. But what if we think of it the other way around? Allowing someone else to bless us will bless them. And so breaking down our walls and allowing someone to help us, since we all can use help in some sort of way, um, could be the kindest thing that you could do for your neighbor. It really could. So put, put away the pride and and the Minnesota nice, and allow someone to neighbor you, too. We live in an Easter world, a resurrection world, heaven on earth. And to be active participants in that, we're called to be Easter neighbors. Can you imagine the impact if everyone in this room decided to take the next step with their neighbors? From the wave stage, to the hey dude stage, to the hey bob, to dinner. Our lives would be transformed, and our cities would look completely different. That's what Easter is all about. So let's be Easter neighbors and allow God to cause us to be who he calls us to be. I, I have a short video also, because um, I think the best way to learn sometimes is to see, see a, a tangible example of someone else doing it. So it's only two minutes long, but I thought it would be great to see see a real-life example. So. I 
we wanted to be in a neighborhood where we could uh, be engaged with other people. So there was an apartment complex near this house that was a lot of people would look at and say, wow, that's scary. I don't know if I want to be in this neighborhood, uh, but it attracted us. One of the things we wanted to do was just have a, a cookout for our neighborhood. We just decided, you know, we wanted to do this, but we wanted to do it in our front yard, not our backyard. You know, a lot of times you say, oh, let's do that off and, you know, have a privacy area. Well, we wanted to be involved with our neighbors. We've had several since then. Uh, and it's really a lot of fun. It's just a great way to engage with them is over food. Bring them in for food and then you get conversation. So it was literally like the first week we moved in, I got a message on my phone. And it said, you might not know me, but I'm your neighbor. You want to come to a barbecue at our place tonight? Yeah, and since then, they've been helping all of our neighbors, all of their neighbors. We've seen them bring us meals. They've do had so much for dinner. Yeah, do so much for this street and this neighborhood. Through relationships with people, you can trust each other. You can depend each other. I think that um, being involved in people's lives can be very messy. and. It's really a lot easier to just drop something off, drop the blanket off, put some money in an envelope and send it off. That's really the easy thing. And I feel like giving of our time is really, um, is a good thing. And it just, it can be difficult, but I think that's what we are called to. Um, we just want to be involved with them, want to love them. It feels like they're our family. Um, when one of the guys invited me over to his house because he wanted me to meet uh, this new girl in his life, uh, and it just felt like I had, a, I had a place in his family too. Wherever we are, we want to do whatever we can to fulfill the Great Commission. While we're here, we want to be engaged with our neighbors. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, Lord, thank you for that reminder that uh, you spoke to us through EJ, that wherever we are, may we do whatever we can. And may it begin here and now, right now, in this place. Lord, prepare our hearts to continue to worship you as we thank you for your presence all around us so that we might go forth and, uh, and share your love as the hands and feet of Christ. Amen.